Okay, good morning, everybody. Hope you had a fun time yesterday. Um, today will even will be even more fun. It's about squeezing your data, how to get more out of your existing data set that you have already collected, labeled, processed. And we're going to talk about data augmentations and self-supervised learning. It's going to be me and Tarun Sharma. And um, yeah, this lecture will become really relevant for you when you're at this stage. You might be overall a little bit confused, that's okay. But you have your data and you might have trained a baseline model that just squeezed, you only live once way, some results out of your data. And now you have this pile of results and you might have even precisely quantified and qualified. Actually not you might have, at this point, you should have precisely quantified and um, measured the quality of your results. And the question now becomes, you have this half squeezed tube of data. Uh, so obviously, you can get more out of it. But uh, the ways are, but the question becomes, what are the easiest ways to do so? So you want to get more results from your existing data. Other scenarios where this be kind, might become particularly relevant is when you have your training performance, but your validation performance doesn't match the training performance, or you have, uh, or you want to generalize to a test set, but you see the performance on the test set isn't as good as on the training set, you might expect some domain shift after you deploy your model, and you want to be prepared for that domain shift when maybe even you collect some more data and you want your model to run on that as well. Maybe you have a small data set, um, it's not large enough for the task complexity you're trying to do where you might have some rare classes. Now, data augmentation, self-supervised learning, they're not a silver bullet. They're not gonna solve all these problems, but they're one out of the uh, many tools we have uh, that we can apply to reduce the size of the problem. Another tool would be to just uh, collect more data. We see here a professor would say, oh, this is your machine learning system. The student says, yep, you pull the data in this big pile of lineage algebra, then collect the answers on the other side. The professor, what's the answer? So wrong. You just stir the pile and it starts looking right. That is kind of true. Um, but the point is that acquiring these large labeled data sets is very costly. So before we do that, um, we want to make sure that we have the easy tricks uh, used. And one of those easy tricks is data augmentation. Anecdotally, it, can it might take only three hours to implement and it can squeeze another 5% uh, of accuracy out of your data. So why do data augmentations work so well? I'm going to explain out of distribution data and an axis of variation, what that is. We're going to categorize augmentations into the go-to augmentations, domain-specific augmentations, and more research-oriented augmentations. And then uh, a quick uh, pointer to how you can get started implementing those. And that's going to take about half an hour. And then the other half an hour, Tarun to to will tell us about his internship in a kind of case study way, uh, how to use self-supervised learning another way to get more out of it, particularly your unlabeled data. Okay, so what does out of distribution mean? You all might remember this comic that um, uh, Sarah showed. And it illustrates that we have an, uh, data points on an X1 and X2 axis, where we have an orange class and we have data points from a blue class. And we have trained our classifier to distinguish those two. And it's doing a pretty good job at that on our training data. Now, the problem is we have our test data set and our test data set all of a sudden lies here. And it looks pretty out of distribution just by looking at it. And the network wrongly classifies all of these out of distribution data points as blue meaning that we failed to generalize onto our test data. Not a great scenario to be in. However, these, is, these are data points on an x1, x2 axis. What does that mean in the image space? Um, you might have talked about this with your instructor. If you train only on images, on camera trap images from day, and you test on images on night or taken in a living room, you wouldn't expect your model to generalize to those. That's pretty easily identified by a human. Sometimes, however, uh, it's less clear why something is out of distribution. For example, here I trained a machine learning model to take a satellite image as input plus a flood predict 
flood plus a flood segmentation map. And I wanted it to predict um, this setting, uh, like a like a post flood satellite image. And we see that on my training set of satellite imagery, it does a pretty good job at predicting an image that looks like the ground truth. However, then after I trained this model on satellite imagery, I collected some aerial imagery that had about the same resolution, and it looked very similar to me as a human, um, as a human. And then <laughs> I, I ran the model, tasked it to predict this image, which is the ground truth, given this image as input and a flood map. And the actual output was this pile of unidentifiable generative uh, garbage. So that didn't look very great. And I was wondering why is my model so bad at generalizing to a data set that looks nearly exactly the same. It turns out that this slight difference in the haze and the color calibration made my uh, aerial images to be completely out of distribution for my neural network. And indeed, this goes along our learning of neural networks are these overparameterized beasts of a model that will tend to learn spurious correlations over interpretable features. Lawrence, yes. Could you augment your way out of that by, by you know, kind of like using the satellite imagery to vary the, the color cast and the, and the, you know, the images in order to allow it to do better on the aerial imagery? Is that, would that be a way? Yes, I did. Yeah, I did a lot of augmentation. It helped a little, but what actually really helped was collecting more data. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so in this case, this out of distribution is, um, you, know, you know, it wasn't as obvious. And then when working with this, I got really into, is there a more quantifiable way other than just looking at the imagery as a human to say what is out of distribution? And this is not totally relevant for you because it, it's more computer vision research, but to show you um, there is ways to do quantify this word, this, this unclear out of distribution word that's so jargonized and used by everybody. Um, for example, if we have this data set of daily imagery and the test data set of night imagery, we might have that idea to calculate the average pixel value across the hill image. And then we might expect that the images collected on day have a higher average pixel intensity than the ones collected during night. And then we could calculate that average pixel intensity across our whole training data set and the average pixel intensity across the whole test data set and then measure the distance. You know, For example, this, the pixel value average is a 50 out of 255 on the test data set, and it's 100 um, on the training data set, and then the distance in between those would be 50. So then that's one way where you can say, OK, now I quantified my test data set is exactly 50 away from my training data set. That's one way where we really use our domain knowledge to try to identify what does out of distribution mean. But in general, this can quickly get very, very tricky where you get into the field of anomaly detection algorithms. And, um, but all these algorithms kind of work in a way you have an image and another image and you would try to calculate the distance in between those images. So the way to do that is you project them into some form of feature space and then you measure the distances in this feature space. Okay, so now you are aware that you have an out of distribution challenge and you are wanting to overcome that over distribution challenge. So here you have your training data set of these two points and your out of distribution data set that you want to classify as orange as well. Would you have any ideas of how you can augment your training data set so that when you train the model again, it correctly classifies your test data set as orange. Whereas augmenting here means adding additional data as randomly sampled. How would you augment your training data? If you have an idea about what to do, one to apply to one for that direction. Okay. Like when you augment, but I thought it's a bit abstract one. Are these images? Okay. Pretend they're really just two big ones. Yeah. I guess like one of this has like different variants of orange and various blue. Mm -hmm. So maybe I would augment 
the orange ones to have like put a filter on them to make them mm -hmm. darker so they look more like ah yeah like supervisor. okay that's one way to go if you have like a like a like a color classifier actually in this case the only thing the model sees is a is the x1 and the x2 as input like, not really. Yeah, it takes like, you could shift everything on the X2 mm -hmm. axis, and then that would put like all of it, and that would push the split like more horizontal. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Onto That's the, the X2 axis. Like shift it to the right. <laughs> oh, yeah. So shift like, all of the data to the right. project all of it to the X1 axis, or like to a to a vertical plane. Yeah, I think Kara saying we put could you move put, all of the data to the right. Yeah, um, all of the data to the right or all of the data to the left. Either way. Yeah. Either way. Yeah. yeah, that seems that that will work. Another way that will work is um, we know that the label. So what yeah. so what Kara used here is we know that the label shouldn't change across the x two axis. So as we move our data points across x two, they should always be orange all of these data points that, and, and, and to be clear again, one data point is just an X1 and an X2 value. So this one might be like one, three, and this one might be 0 0.5, 3.5. So we check, we vary them along the X2 axis, and then we know they're all still orange. And what Cairo used here is this knowledge, this domain knowledge of our training data set, knowing that the labels shouldn't change across the X2 axis. And that axis that we used here, we call that informally the axis of variation, which is a colloquial term referring to a dimension in our data set that we can vary without changing our label. For example, the brightness of an image shouldn't change the dog classification. Okay, so we augment, ah, and then once after we identified it, we augment across the X2 axis, meaning we uh, take our training data set and we randomly sample uh, we randomly uh, we add random noise to the x2 value, shifting the data points to the right and to the left, and the with the blue data set as well, shifting them to the right and to the left. And that then we retrain our classifier, and now the classifier has learned a horizontal uh, decision boundary, which will distinguish perfectly our blue from our orange data. Side note: there is also other ways. Um, to make the problem simpler, Kyra mentioned you can project everything to the x1 axis and then you reduce the complexity of the problem from a two-dimensional x2, x1 to just a one-dimensional problem that's just x1. And similarly, uh, I can recommend you all to talk with your instructors uh, about ways to introduce your domain knowledge. For example, Chris and I were looking, uh, Penguin Chris and I were looking <laughs> at his Guano uh, satellite imagery um, and he actually has available a land water mask where he knows that guano will only be over the land and not over the water. Uh, so we uh, use that in our model to inform it with that domain knowledge and make the pr prediction task simpler. Okay, so we're at this point where hopefully you have an idea of what an excess of variation mean and means. And I would ask you to pair up with the person next to you to brainstorm uh, two axes of variation in your data set and whether there are any augmentations you can think of that capture these axes of variations. Optionally, you can also note on two augmentations that would definitely not work because they remove the signal from your data set. You have about three minutes for that. <laughs> I 
Yeah, but I mean, it's not going to be the same site, the same Yeah, sure. So say you have something that you want to use to be a to make everything break scale so that it can learn better at night. So I'm not going to identify it. Because I want to have seen it. Okay, thank you, everybody. I hope you find some good augmentations. One possible solution would have been to add hats onto every animal, onto every animal, because clearly yeah. having a hat or not, it would still be the same animal. <laughs> so you introduce your domain knowledge into this task. Uh, now further, we want and uh, props also to Justin for that idea. Uh, categorizing your augmentations, we will have some go-to augmentations, some very domain-specific augmentations, and some augmentations that are still in research. Go-to augmentations is flipping. You take your image and you randomly flip it with a likelihood of 50% uh, to the left or to the right. Works very well in classification, detection, segmentation, generally images, remote sensing. However, care needs to be taken in case you work in re-identification or audio data. For example, in re-identification, if we have a leopard and we flip that onto the other side, we're actually generating a new leopard uh, because the prints on the left and on the right side of the leopard don't match each other. Um, and then and then we're asking the model to say, this is the same leopard, even though it's not the same leopard technically. Other ones are random crop, uh, meaning you have your input image and you randomly take a crop out of that image and you resize it to the full image. That works very well, for example, in aerial imagery where we fly our drone at various heights because it kind of simulates that axis of variation. Care needs to be taken, transform your input and your label. If you have bounding boxes, they will also need to be uh, grown to the size uh, proportionately. Do, do not, uh, poss possibly this can be very harmful in satellite data or in audio again, where maybe the, where the satellite flies at a constant height and then the size of the uh, animal or whatever you're observing with respect to um, 
with respect to the rest of the image might be very important. So here, for example, unclear whether it's a whale or a tuna. Okay, real quick. So this would work for things that have different fields of or different like focal distances. Um, so yeah, like sometimes animals are really close to the camera and sometimes mm. they're far away. That would work. Right. That seems like a good idea okay. because the size of the animal shouldn't change the classification of the animal. Cut out. The idea of cutout is our networks are over-parameterized, remember, and they learn spurious correlations over interpretable features. So they might have learned that Bushnell camera logo, or they might learn that cats can be only classified by looking at the ears. So cutout randomly removes areas of our image, these tiny blocks, and sets all the values to zero with the idea that our network learns to look at other areas of the image as well. So for example, the whiskers or the tail of a cat are also nice identifiers. However, if you work with audio data, you might accidentally cut out the signal if you have a bird call that's only uh, present in a small range of the frequency spectrum. Or if you have worked with very tiny animals, um, you know, don't cut out the tiny animals out of your image because then it'll be hard to classify. Blur and downsample are the go-to um, Go to augmentations. Sure, loves to do this for her uh, water imagery, where you might have a high resolution image, but actually the data set has a lot of low resolution images as well. So we can just uh, blur the image and have another uh, another sample. Uh, there's also a professor in uh, Montreal, David Rolnick, who works with moths, and then he wants to classify, uh, identify moths. And um, he has found that adding blurry moths to his data set has significantly increased the performance, uh, possibly because um, if you have a high resolution moth, the network is learning to uh, de detect those very fine grained patterns of the moth. However, if we feed in blurry images, it might learn these, uh, these, these higher level features more easily. We are. Yeah. Would you do those that blurring with satellite imagery too for the same reason, having it learn like fine scale features versus like maybe something larger? Yeah, there could be. I've I've seen some satellite imagery that comes out blurry. So so like if you expect your test data set to be blurry, then you can add that that blur as an augmentation. The reason you're saying like forcing it to not learn something so fine scale, but something more spatially larger scale. Like would you ever blur? I. I presume that that was not the only reason why why it works so well. I think maybe the test data set also just had a, a lot of blurry moths in it. Yeah, they were they yeah. were training using iNaturalist data and testing on data from moth camera traps that yeah. was just long, like the moths themselves were smaller, lower resolution, often less well like less nice in its quality. I think a lot of the benefit. It might actually be, and that's an interesting intuition, that training on lower resolution stuff makes you learn features that are recognizable in lower resolution, but you might not need to do that if your mm. actual test data is not low resolution. Like maybe there's useful information you lose at lower resolution. Mm. So forcing your model to ignore it might not be a good thing if you know that your test data is not low. That's a really good point. Uh, in the interest of time, could you note down that question, maybe send it via Slack or ask me after the lecture? Could you just repeat the name of the podcast? David Rolnick. Sorry? David Rolnick. Rolnick. Yeah. Like uh, I'll follow. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Domain specific augmentations are ones that are kind of more difficult to implement, but they might be really helpful. For example, Sarah finds that in camera trap images, it's really helpful. Um, in that scenario where you might have uh, a lot of images from 10 cameras, however, your animal occurs very frequently in five cameras and only infrequently, but it doesn't occur in the other five cameras. You might take those images of this animal, run a segmentation model, crop out the animal and insert it into empty backgrounds of those other five cameras, giving you a lot more images from those other five cameras. And there's a paper that shows that can uh, increase the robustness very drastically. Mixup is amazing for audio. Uh, you might have an mi mi mix up means you have two samples, for example, one from rainforest, just rain rainforest recordings, and another one from a monkey recording, a monkey call. And then you interpolate those two to create a new sample. 
one that is rainforest plus monkey, which obviously makes a lot of sense because monkeys are found in rainforests. You could also do that too. If you have one monkey call and another monkey call, you overlay them and you interpolate and you have two monkey calls. Camera settings, you might want to vary over the hue, the saturation, the brightness, contrast, or color. However, that can get quickly quite tricky. For example, Jess was pointing out um, in, in, in um, his imagery, there is, a, there is a, a red kangaroo and an eastern gray kangaroo. And really the only feature that distinguishes them is the color of the fur. So if we were to augment over the color, we're not sure anymore this middle image is that from the eastern gray or from the red kangaroo. So here's a list for you to later look up of those domain specific augmentations. Still in research, these ideas sound very cool. Like for example, we might go ahead and add a lot of simulated data. Uh, which can be a very good idea. It can strongly increase the performance on VR classes. And we have that nice control over which exact classes do we want to add onto our, onto our data set? What's the brightness? Maybe you have some, uh, some, some really cool um, sun glare that we can add into our data set. However, it can actually decrease the performance on real data because now we have a model that's trained on real and on simulated data. But more overall, it was just a lot of effort and a lot of money and a lot of time spent on developing this augmentation. Whereas then I think the paper even shows that if you would have just used copy and paste augmentation, which takes like a day or two to implement, uh, it performed nearly as well. So other ideas like this are using a generative vision model, such as again, or a diffusion-based model to augment your data set, using things like reinforcement learning or meta learning to come up with the best augmentation strategy or augmenting with adversarial examples. So these ideas are very cool, I have to be honest. And uh, I'm sure there will be people that want to buy, you know, that toothpaste squeezer thing to get the very last bit out of your data. Uh, and they're very passionate about it. So for the implementation, you generally want to define an augmentation pipeline with multiple augmentations. You start with your image, you load it into um, in, into memory in your get item function. And then once it's in memory, you apply uh, an augmentation pipelines such as cropping, flipping, uh, brightness, and then all the other augmentations. However, take care to not overdo it. Um, you might in a, end up in a situation where you've applied every augmentation everywhere all at once. So my recommendation is to log, man, uh, to log the augmented samples into Comet or Wanda. Uh, just for a sanity check that uh, these are still somewhat real looking images. For implementation, I recommend the Albumentations library if you work with images, the Cornea library if you work with remote sensing imagery, or the Open Soundscape uh, if you work with audio. Sam here is definitely the expert in that. Um, and uh, there's an interactive code to get you started. Uh, click on this and then it'll show you how to implement it. But I what think only if it's not already oh, yeah. implemented in Piper. Yeah. So like if it's already or, or whatever code base you're using, if, if if augmentations are already implemented there, use those ones. This is like, ah, it looks like this code base hasn't implemented Gaussian blur as an augmentation option yet. So I can import augmentations and use their implementation. So just like a library that I would use if it's not in main What was the remote sense one you said? Cornea. K-O-R-N-I-A. And there is also a backup slide that has more details on that. Thanks. Okay. Um, so you've augmented all of this. And my warning here, out of just personal learnings, is uh, it's a deep, dark rabbit hole. I think I spent two months augmenting my satellite imagery that you saw in, that you have seen in the beginning. And then um, in the end, when I just added more data, I got I got way better performance out of it. So make sure that you plot sort of your result before augmentation and after augmentation so that you, you can track how much performance increased, how much iterative perform, incremental performance increase you get. And data augmentation helps, but it's also not a silver bullet. Eventually you might uh, see that you have all these rare classes of which you only have 10 images, and then it's definitely more useful. Just go out and label uh, 90 more images of those samples. Okay, now we got Tarun. Hey, 
I think that is similar to oversampling your data, what what um Justin I think was talking about. Yeah. Okay, we'll call, uh, the, Not okay. for all of the classes. Maybe right. it's a yeah. image the way we just call it that for us in that case. Yeah. I think I think there's some cases where that might be reasonable. Um, but doing augmentations on your data generally shouldn't hurt you on a common class. Mm -hmm. So I, I think having the same augmentation pipeline for every class might be totally fine. And maybe actually what you're trying to do is get more diverse representations for that class. Given that the augmentations are random, you get more diverse representations if you sample the class more. So the combination of data augmentation and oversampling your random class essentially means you're going to see more variation for that class because you're randomly pulling these different augmentations. Um, and one of the things that we talk about, sometimes it's much more complicated augmentations like copy paste. We always say, oh, you wanna do this in your pipeline, but sometimes stuff is so complex because you're actually using other machine learning models as part of the augmentation that it's really better to just do it ahead of time because otherwise it's gonna massively blow up the complexity of your, your machine learning training. Um, and so for those, I might, again, sort of, maybe what we did in the paper is we only used copy paste for rare classes where we thought we needed it because it was just kind of ex an expensive operation. And so we didn't do it for the common ones because we had enough data to learn them well. So kind of both. Cool. So um, thanks, Bjorn. And continuing the theme of squeezing your data, and we say data, of course, it's not only, I, I don't think anyone in this room probably has all of their data annotated, like in terms of all of their field data collected over years and years annotated. You have some subset annotated and some subset on, uh, not annotated. So um, how do you then go about making use of some of this unlabeled data, either by getting some data labeling um, in an easier fashion, getting annotations in an easier fashion, or in cases where it's really hard, uh, then we'll talk about some of these like more complicated techniques of using your unlabeled data in the self-supervised way. Yeah. Um, so if you look at this um, made up plot of um, different types of uh, tasks in machine learning, um, which you guys are familiar by now, uh, and this is a plot of the cost in terms of time and effort to annotate um, versus the uh, information contained in that annotation. So if a human were to look at an image and classify, you, it, that would take some time and it has some value. Um, if a human were to take some time and draw some boxes, that has more value because uh, you know not only what's in the image, but where it is as well. Um, and then, of course, that takes more time and it's harder to do. And so the same with segmentation, which is like labeling every pixel or drawing a mask it takes a lot of time per image, but you have a lot of information on the exact shape of the object and stuff. So uh, if you have unlabeled data now, uh, in addition to your labeled data set, you can do some, you can use like some of some existing machine learning models to help you get labels on that data. Um, for example, for classification, instead of having a human uh, look at it and say what's in it, like maybe you use a pre-trained model on ImageNet or some uh, other database um, if, if your model is, uh, yeah, if, if there's one available for your particular task. And the same thing for detection, uh, you can use something like mega detector to get boxes automatically around animals. And for segmentation as well, there's Facebook's segment anything um, that Martin is uh, is is using um, to some extent for getting his annotations using the machine learning model. There are also ways to do this. In some cases, your task might be simple enough where you don't even need to rely on these machine learning models. You you have these like simpler heuristics, which um, for example, color detection. So in the case of um, 
this data set that I collected of ants, um, the ants have this like characteristic brownish red color on this uniform bark. So this was like a camera facing a bark in a small tub. So this wasn't in the in the wild per se. It was like simulated data set. Um, and then just by detecting a certain color, just by subtracting color channels and let's say searching for the color brown, you can get these uh, blue boxes. The model is able to find those uh, by doing that and then thresholding. And you see the ant in the green box is actually one that it missed because the ant was like in a crevice, it was like sideways. So the thorax, the, the brownish portion wasn't that visible. So um, to make the point that these are giving you boxes for free um, without a human having to sit and draw them, but they might not be perfect and they might be um, some misses in there and hence they are lower in value. Um, another approach for this is background subtraction. So this was a project done by a student of the summer school last year, Francesca Pons, where she was looking, uh, she was using these upward facing cameras um, to track fruit flies that were released in bulk. And the flies move across the frame like really, really fast. They, it, within like five frames where you're recording at 30 frames per second, they're in and out of the frame. Whereas all the clouds and all of the stuff in the background is also moving, but it's moving at a much slower rate. So in background subtraction, you can have literally a background image and update that background image um, ever so often. And then if you had this as your, if the, if you had the previous frame as your background image and then the fly was moving across, the only thing that's changing essentially in those two frames is the fly. And these are annotations actually really hard to do um, by a human because the fly is so small as shown in that red circle. So, um, Again, these might not be perfect. And then this, the settings that we used for the background subtraction changed from video to video because the in some cases there were no clouds, some places the sun was like really bright. So there was a little bit of like um, manually playing around with these parameters at the start of each video. Um, but then again, we didn't have to go and sit through every frame and try to find the fly in every frame. For segmentation as well, uh, background subtraction works. Same same principle. Uh, you have a background frame, and then you have a, a which you have, you have a background model, which is essentially a frame, which you update ever so often, and then you take your current frame and you subtract the two. And if there's like some differences in the pixel scales and some some threshold, uh, then you just you get a mask from that. You just that's just the difference of those two frames. Um, so these are some techniques that if your data, which might not work in most cases in the wild where you have a camera trap facing an environment that's constantly moving. There's like wind, there's plants moving and stuff like that. So these simple methods might not work, but it's worth thinking about them uh, when you look at your data. Um, like if you have data collected in the lab where the background is really fixed and the lighting is really fixed, then can some of these simpler methods give you um, these annotations from your unlabeled data in a, in a much uh, less expensive way in terms of time and effort. Um, and these essentially just like computer vision tricks. Um, but uh, but uh, in some, this might not be applicable in all cases. For example, in this case, um, which is an image taken by autonomous vehicle on the water, you have lots and lots of animals. And um, these annotations are just really, really time consuming for a human to sit and draw these boxes around every single animal. And um, this might be the case for you. Uh, if you've tried those tricks previously and none of them work, but you still have a lot of unlabeled data, which is of this type where uh, annotations are really expensive in terms of time. Um, what are some of the techniques that we can use um, which come in this domain of self-supervised learning, which I'll talk about now. Um, but everyone with me so far? All good? Cool. So um, before we talk about self-supervised learning, uh, I do want to explain quickly what a representation is. Um, because you've been seeing these plots with the orange dot and the blue dot, and I'll show some more of those, but just so that we are all on the same page, if you have your machine learning model, um, the image goes in on the left, um, over here, and then the outputs are on the right. And this, in this case, this could be like classification. The output could be cat, dog, zebra, or whatever, like the outputs. And the, the left would be, um, your image just stretched out into a long vector and fed in. And this is a feed forward neural network. This could be replaced by a convolutional neural network or whatever. But the idea being that um, when we say a representation, 
we mean the last layer before the output, so the penultimate layer. Um, so the model is taking, any sort of model that you use is taking your image in pixel space and it's projecting it to this um, n-dimensional um, feature space where n is can be some small number. Um, and in this space, which is these this set of numbers defined in, in this shown in this red box, um, this is a representation for an image. So the model is when we when we are training, the model is um, learning to project your images into this um, vector such that the last layer can then easily just draw a line across those two separated um, projected feature spaces. And then if this last layer, obviously we can't visualize uh, this five dimensional feature space, uh, but if you imagine that that, that layer in shown in red was just a set of two nodes that if your uh, representation space is of two nodes, then we can plot it on a graph. And then that's what this would look like. Like each plot, like N and M would be just those two numbers. And each image would, um, would this model would map the image from the pixel space to these sets of two numbers in, in such a fashion that allows your last layer, which is your classifier layer to then easily just separate these using a line or using um, a combination of lines. Um, so is that like, so when we, are, when we are showing these orange and blue dots, these are the, um, this feature space. So the second to last layer, if you had a two dimensional, uh, if you had a two dimensional feature space, of course you had a three dimensional, it would be a three dimensional plot and so on. But the idea is just that you're projecting it into this lower dimensional space where things are more separable, easily separable. Um, so, okay, cool. If anyone has any questions about that, um, or, or it's, it's clear, yeah. Yeah, so if this is like a two-dimensional feature space, yeah. uh, wouldn't it be cool to learn how to plot, maybe this is associated with the last layer when the classification happens, and then you have them cluster, you know, a species clusters here, another species cluster here, and that's it's informative because you'll see where they overlap and yeah. there are similar species. Or something yeah, like yeah. Uh, so this is a really common approach. So often those feature spaces are 2048 dimensional spaces. So clearly they're not very easily to human for humans to interpret. But um, a really common way to just roughly see if these things are reasonably separable is to take the take PCA over your embedding space and project it down two or three dimensions and then plot them and color each embedding by the category. And this is like a very nice interpretable thing where you can just see like, hey, are these things reasonably clusterable in the maximal two dimensions of variation in the embedding space? And if that thing just looks like total garbage, it's kind of like, ah, okay, it might be that it's not really learning something or it might be that actually just projecting it down to two dimensions is really like reducing the information. So if it doesn't look great, that's not like, it's not like it's like a counterfactual. You can't say that like in two dimensions the clustering doesn't look good, therefore it's a bad embedding space. But you definitely can say if in two dimensions it does look good, that seems quite promising. No. So um so if you look at all of your data think, in these two Caleb, classes. I think we still have oh sorry. Okay. Go ahead. So in that n dimensional feature yeah. space, like you have all your features and a whole bunch of them. Yeah. Do you actually like conceptually draw a line, even though it's not really a line. It's a hyperplane. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so in two dimensions. That means you draw a hyperline. <laughs> you draw a line in n dimensions. So it's like a it's like a plane. Yeah. 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 So yeah. two dimensions it would be a line and three dimensions it would be a plane uh -huh. separating these things and then any more dimensions hyperplane. It's, it's something that we can't visualize, right? It's not perfect. It's a flat thing in that many dimensions. It's, just don't don't worry about it. It's, yeah. You can, you can find hours trying to build. Humans actually cannot conceptualize very well in more than, I think, four dimensions. And I, once we get to five, it's like we just can't do it. So, so just, there's one line per class? No. Um. So if you had two classes, in this case, if you're separating a dog from that eel, then your classifier uh, in this two dimensional space would just be one line because you're separating these two things. But if you had like three classes and there would be two lines, no, then you have like. Yeah. Oh, no, no. If you had 
two dimensions with three classes. Two dimensions, but three. So classes. if you had like a third color dot on there, then with two lines, you can separate all of them, right? But, or, or, or an easier or, way to think about it is in a one versus all scenario. So as, yeah. assume you had another color. If you're doing multiple classes and it's in two dimensions, mm -hmm. basically you could make one line for every color. Mm -hmm. so that yeah, tries to say like, okay, orange is up here, green is over there, blue is down there. Okay. Yeah. And so then, sorry, just one last thing. So yeah. then when you are testing and you make your feature space and it, your dot is somewhere, then it picks the best line. So that's at training time. And then at testing time, all you're doing is you're, you have the line and now you're projecting something and saying, which side of the line is it on? And then that's your decision. Okay. So if it's kind of close to the line, maybe it's like not very certain, for example. Okay. Yeah. But this is actually the model doing that? This is a human representation of what- This is a very, very simplified yeah. representation that, that's just trying to build some intuition about yeah. what's going on. But yeah, that last classification layer is often something like just a logistic regression over embeddings. So okay. it is somewhat like, it's a very simple model. And so we learn a complex embedding space that enables us to categorize things using a very simple model. Right. So if you look at all of your data, and let's say this is the spread, um, what you're doing when, when, as we just discussed, during training, you're trying to separate these these dots, right? Um, but if you don't have too many examples, or if the task is just really hard, um, let's say if you don't have too many examples, and you know that machine learning models don't do well when you don't have too many examples, you can only separate like so much, right? You can only take like, you can only, it, it's not, it's not going to be as good. Um, then you don't have so many examples because it's, it's not a lot of data to learn from. So we haven't gotten to the unlabeled data yet. So now with the unlabeled data, if you could in this um, feature space, take your unlabeled data and learn a good starting point and like bear with me and I'll, I'll talk about these methods. But if you could just imagine that you could take all your unlabeled data and learn a good starting point, which is learn a better feature space is like or, or a way to project your label data into this feature space. So now if you've changed your, your model or whatever such that now when you project these images, the uh, without even any training having been done yet, they are already kind of almost separable. And then you do your uh, regular training, then it's much easier to separate, right? So that's kind of the whole aim with the unlabeled data. We're trying to use data without labels and, and again, I'll talk about these in the next few slides, but just imagine this like some magical way you can do stuff with data, with images, without knowing what those images are. But what we're trying to do with that is we're trying to uh, get to this better starting point. And then we take your label data and then we do this training step and then it's much easier to separate these. So um, one of the ways, like one of these like magical methods is um, called simple contrast learning, sim CLR where like you have an image, but you don't know the labels, you don't know what this is. You can apply as beyond just showed us various augmentations. And as beyond was saying, we know that these, any two of these should be the same category. Um, even though we don't know what that category is, we still know that like any form transformation would still be the same category. So you can train a model with that, with that information and without actually having the labels by just saying that in your data set, if you take two transformed versions of a image, um, and those are those two dog word, uh, dog clips over there, um, they should be closer together in this representation space, and everything else, like all your other images, like your chair and stuff like that, should be further away in this representation space. So, um, is that somewhat is the is the at least the intuition clear of what we're trying to do? Where so we don't actually need the labels to do this. We're just passing the image to a model, getting that like that representation layer. Um, and we are just trying to match, we are trying to bring together those two representation um, uh, sets of numbers from two transformed versions of the same image. And then whatever those vectors are from all other images, we are pushing them away. So as to try to cluster um, similar images automatically without, without any labels. Um, and another, so that's, that's one method. And another method is, um, kind of this, a similar approach where you're taking two transformed versions of the image and you're saying that they're the same, or you're, you're teaching a model that these representations should be closer, but the way you're doing it is slightly different. 
So in this case, you're actually using some of the addition, the label data that you have. So you have your label set, which is the support samples. Um, and then you, um, so let's say this is your label data. Let's say you have four classes of a wolf, a dog, a capybara, and a cat. Um, and that's your, those are the images that you have labels for. So you rep, you project these into this representation space. So imagine each of these images is actually like a point in this two dimensional representation space of that class. And then you take your unlabeled image um, and then throw it into that space, pass it to the model and see how far it lies from these other known classes. So you could do that for the, both the versions of the same image and look at the distances away from these um, known uh, labeled examples. And then based on the distances, you're assigning what's called a pseudo label. So like a, a soft pseudo label. So you're not saying that, oh, uh, what's the closest thing? It's a wolf in this case. So you're not saying that it's a wolf, but you're saying that, oh, it's like 0 0.6 probability that it's a wolf and it's 0 0.2 that it's a dog, et cetera. It's just giving it a probability um, uh, distribution, um, a soft label. And then you've, so you've done this for both versions of your um, unknown image. And then, so you have two labels, and then you're training the model to say that these two labels should match up. Um, so it's kind of essentially the same thing, saying two transform versions should be the same, but in this case, you're using your labeled examples to, to kind of give you um, an idea of, of where they should be in, in comparison to your uh, label set already. So, um, so now I talk about the, uh, so I actually use these methods in this internship that I did at the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute this summer. Um, so they have been collecting deep sea data from the same spot or like a small subset of spots in the ocean for many, many years, like 30 years. And they have lots and lots of data and they have uh, lots of annotated data, but they also have loads and loads of just images of animals where you have no labels. So the first thing I did was take the images and run it through like a mega detector like model to find um, where the animals are. Um, and this is, uh, yeah, you, you guys have seen examples of mega detector and stuff, so you know what this means. So this is just a generalized detector. It's just looking for animals and just pulling those out. And then these are the crops extracted, um, a screenshot from my computer. So we have a certain fraction of these that are labeled um, and a huge fraction of these that are just crops and un unlabeled. We don't know what they are, but there is some information in there, as we saw with the dog. Uh, a model could potentially learn from just taking a, a, a dog and a flipped version of a dog. It's learning, still learning something. There's still information in that image to learn about maybe what is a rotation or or, or, or something like that uh, to build this better representation space. So first is do the standard approach, which is you just take your label data, which is what we've been doing in the school. And then you look at, you look at it. So on the x-axis is the different species. So I have like 50 species in this data. And then the y-axis is the number of images per species. So you see this long tail distribution, which a lot of people have um, this data in the wild, usually it's exhibits this long tail distribution. Um, and then you train a model on this, just this label data. And um, as, uh, as, as she showed us, you can calculate a metric per class, which is like the recall score. So basically on the x-axis is the species sorted in that same order as shown before in the same order. Uh, of increasing to decreasing number of instances, uh, number of images. And then the y-axis is a score from zero to one. And that's the recall score. Can be thought of like a, an accuracy per class, but it's a recall. It's like the, yeah, you guys know what recall is. Um, true positives by true positives plus misses. So it's just a score from zero to one. That could easily be like precision or whatever, but you pick one thing such that everything, all the classes range from zero to one. And then you look at the performance across this labeled, uh, uh, using only the labeled data set on the test set. And then you see that the performance also follows this long tail distribution, which makes sense because we know that machine learning models don't do super well when they have less data, right? And they do pretty well when they have lots of data as, as on the left. Um, so now uh, we haven't used the unlabeled data yet. So now we're gonna try to use only the unlabeled data and do this, this contrastive um, SimCLR approach to learn this, hopefully learn this better starting point and then train on your label data again. So you, you're doing this approach, the one with the, with the dog, the, the augmentations, first approach. And then the second step is to fine tune on this um, or to train on your label data from that 
hopefully better starting point. And um, this is what we see. So B A is like kind of the balanced accuracy, which is just uh, the average of all of these numbers. So the accuracy has gone up slightly. Um, and we see interestingly that um, it seems to do better on the rare classes as compared to the supervised the standard model, uh, which is just using label data, but it seems to do slightly worse on the common classes on, on the, um, in which the supervised model does uh, better. Um, and then I also went out and tried um, using the second approach, which uses a combination of your label data to assign these pseudo labels to your unlabeled images. So that's pause. And then you train that starting point and then you train on your label data. And you see a much bigger improvement um, across the board. So the accuracy across classes seems much more balanced um, using when you use these um, uh, self-supervised methods to train on your unlabeled data, to, to learn something from your unlabeled data starting point and then train on your labeled data. So you get a much more balanced performance, yeah? So does pause have a semi-supervised? Um, yeah, it is semi-supervised because you're, yeah. And are you assuming that if you did a sample of labeled data, that um, all of your unlabeled data will fit into those classes? Or that's a very good question. Assign like a unknown class, and then you could use yeah. like a sim CLR -S yeah. approach to look at those. Yeah, I wanted to answer that question as well in my internship. Um, but I didn't have time to. So I, I put an unknown class in this case, which is that last minus one on the right side. That's my unknown class. So I have um, 50 other species of animals in that unknown class. But that question of whether if your unlabeled images are from uh, are consistent of images of different animals, whether that still helps or not, I would still I would also like to answer that question. And um, maybe it's out there in the literature, but I didn't test that um, yet on, on this data. But um, yeah, so this is pretty cool. We've used more of our data, unlabeled data, in this um, self-supervised manner, learned a better starting point. And then once we start from this starting point in this representation space, we get a much more balanced performance across classes. Um, of course, um, there, of course, this was not a trivial. It, it took time and effort to try this approach, and it might or might not work for you. So some guidelines are when doing the data annotation itself is, is really time consuming or expensive um, as we saw in that initial image. Um, and then you also have loads of unlabeled images in the same domain. If your unlabeled images are in a different domain, it might not work so well. Um, and if you have an unbalance in your data, these methods might help you. Although they give you the same overall accuracy, if you just look at your data set and calculate the overall accuracy, it's probably the same but you have a much more balanced performance across classes. And that just depends on your application, right? Like in some cases, maybe all of your classes are equally important, but if you're just focusing on like a particular species, then um, one class maybe, then maybe these methods might not help you. And then Eli, who was an instructor in the last year of summer school, he has this cool paper on when, when does contrastive visual representation learning work? And he tested out some of these questions um, of like, what if you use data from out of domain or what if your uh, label data set size is so big that this the additional gain you get from this unlabeled data is really not that much or like, what is the limit of your label data to, um, to, to which um, at which point these methods won't help you. Um, so yeah, that's it. Um, cool. Um, maybe so we have a, a in-person speaker, our only 